This is Father Patrick Briscoe. And this is Father Bonaventure Chapman. Welcome to Godsplaining. Thanks to all who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation to our project on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to Godsplaining wherever you listen to your podcasts. This is an important episode of Godsplaining. Unlike Every episode most. of Godsplaining is important, but this one is more important than the others. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, all, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Yeah. Uh, George Orwell, of course. Yes. So, uh, so this is an episode about my deepest Orwellian fears, uh, which are that the computers are going to take over everything. Okay. And human beings are going to be eliminated, which is to say we're talking about AI. That's right. So, Father Bonaventure, as we were sitting here before the show, I opened up ChatGPT uh-huh. and I asked it, what is God's planning? Oh, great. What does it say? And it told me, Godsplaining is a portmanteau of God and explaining, similar in structure to the more widely known term mansplaining. Oh, okay. It refers to an act of explaining religious concepts, theology, or spiritual beliefs in a condescending or oversimplified way. Oh, that's us, yeah. This term is often used in a critical context, implying that the explainer is speaking about religious matters in a manner that is patronizing or overly simplistic possibly underestimating the listener's own understanding or beliefs. Wow. So That's... apparently it's a thing, you know, according to Chad GPT. Well, or yeah. Chad GPT just made that up. Correct. It, it, sort of it thing. will, it yeah. will in fact lie to you as we know. So then I asked it, uh, I asked Chad GPT, I said, is it a podcast? Mm-hmm. And it said, yes, God's planning is indeed a podcast. It's hosted by five Dominican friars of the province of St. Joseph. Who knows about us? In this podcast, they delve into various topics encompassing philosophical, theological, cultural aspects, and more. The podcast aims to present ideas from the church's tradition and to apply them to life's most urgent questions, offering insight and discussion on a range of subjects related to faith and contemporary life. Right. And then the question is, how does that relate to the opening definition? (laughs) And then I said, do the friars do that well? Uh-huh. And it said, as an AI language model, I don't have personal opinions or the ability to listen to podcasts. Yeah. Oh, However. Just fact and value distinction. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. However, I could provide some general insights based on the concept of the God's Planning podcast and typical listener feedback for such programs. Oh, right. Oh. Meaning it just generated a bunch of yeah, nonsense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's great. So there we are. Yeah. Chat GPT knows what we are and is talking about us. At least when I ask about us. Yeah, it's, you know... So we can talk about it. Yes, and this is a newer thing, although AI's been around. I mean, I remember when I when AI first showed up, gosh, it was in, maybe I was in high school or something, or maybe it was in college, but they had an AI thing that you could go and you could ask a question. I think it was in college, maybe. So early, this is early 2000s. And you go to this website and you could ask this AI thing questions and it would kind of give you potted responses. You could have conversations with it, but it was, it was not that impressive. You know, it's a bit like when video phone first uh, appeared. Technology generally appears, has its first run, uh, it plants seeds, and then it shows up again some numbers of years later. Mm-hmm. So video phones were, I remember in the late 90s, they were going to be the biggest thing in the world. You're gonna, all your phones going to have video, little links to them. You're going to be calling people by faces. Movies would have this. Um, and it just didn't take off. But of course, uh, video phones with FaceTime did take off. And... I notice on college campuses, people, students are often talking on their phones to other people. They're calling. I've, during the time when Father Gregory was writing his dissertation, we would FaceTime uh, on Sundays. Mm-hmm. And instead of listening to someone's voice, it was nice to actually see someone and talk to talk to them face right. to face, you could say. Right. Uh, and Zoom meetings, of course, do this sort of thing. So video phones didn't take off initially, but actually now, not same as regular, but it might be the case that you will just, when you have an opportunity, just to speak face to face with someone. So video phones came came of age, you could say, twenty years later, thirty years later. Uh, I think it's similar with AI because that first run of AI was not that impressive or interesting. Didn't see what you could do with the applications. It was just kind right. of a fun piece, and there was right. a- AI in terms of conversational informational uh, interface. But now, uh, maybe it was last spring or something with ChatGTP and generative AI, lar- large language models, right. learning models. Boom, AI came out in force, and uh, from every field, it seems like uh, this is now something people have to reckon with and deal with. Yeah, I, so, so I think uh, what, what you've said there is, is very important to understand that this is not something that just appeared yesterday. 
right? Uh, there, there have been there have been uh, various AI AI programs that have been developed and have been people have been using them for some time. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the impact of this is going to be something that we're going to that we're going to have to reckon with. Uh, there was a bit a bit of a controversy this fall. Uh, with Sports Illustrated because mm. uh, researchers demonstrated that Sports Illustrated had generated fake journalists. Uh, they, they, so these were AI AI generated journalists that don't that don't exist that were writing AI generated articles right. about sports. Yeah, and uh, the the that controversy was interesting to me because people didn't care. Yep. Yeah, they did. They didn't care. Uh, yeah. Well, you might think you might have thought that actually, when you read Sports Illustrated journal articles, you're not reading to have a conversation with that person. You're just trying to get information. Right. Um, so actually, why should it matter? Right. That it's not, not written by a human. You know. I think the difference. It. This, and we'll get into this. This points up to a bigger issue about what it means to be human and why actually we care a lot more about being human than we let on because we haven't had to deal with the possible replacement. Of being human, like transhumanism has really not been an issue, uh, and our humanity has not been threatened at its essence until really getting close now. Yeah, and I think that's a great that that's a great point. So, uh, so at the outset of the conversation, you know, the thing that I want to underscore is that uh, yeah, this has been incorporated into our world, and that there are plenty of uses uh, that are not disconcerting to people at large. You mm-hmm. know, including. Things that things that I thought would be, I thought people would be up in arms that uh, that there were these faux sports journalists, um, but but people weren't, mm-hmm. and yeah. for, for all I know, Sports Illustrated is continuing to do this. Yes, and I'm sure they will, um, because there's money to be made. Yes, uh, so so I I think that um, I think that as we as we begin the conversation about artificial intelligence and the way that it's being incorporated in our everyday life. Uh, the thing, the thing that we have to uh, uh, recognize is that we did hit a major shift. Mm-hmm. You know, so, something like you're proposing with the I, the way that iPhone changed the the past history of video calling. Yes, we've hit that moment. Yeah, um, I think that's right. With with uh, software programs like ChatGPT that are language learning models that can that can freely converse with you. Um, yeah. This is a new. This is a new moment. It can do something different. And also, I mean, it, I and everyone has different experiences of this, depending on their on their their life, their professions, and what they're doing. But uh, for me, as a teacher, for instance, it comes in with with student essays and such. Um, and there's, it's been a long time since a student wrote an essay by hand with no assistance of anything else, with books, anything like that. We're just, that's just a different essay, right? Um, there's been Wikipedia. There's been you can ask right. different things. There's always been this, but the there has been a shift with AI because AI will generate uh, essays entirely from scratch. Well, it requires you to prompt, so it's essay engineering prompt prompts. Um, and what's interesting to me was in grading these things, uh, it's not so much that I worry about the finding these which ones which, but the experience of uh, actually grading a non-human product. Right. So, this is, so before, so the, I compare the difference between plagiarism uh, mm-hmm. and AI plagiarism, which is not plagiarism. The AI generator isn't taking it from anywhere else. That's why you can't catch it with most most sensors, like turn it in or safe assign or something. It has a harder time catching AI because it, it can't show you exactly where this thing is from, this quote or what have you. It's not from anywhere. Um, it's also harder to prove that someone has generated this piece, not themselves, because you can't point to, yeah, you got this from this as other person's essay or from right. this page because it's 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 generating from scratch but the interesting part to me was in reading these things is when i read someone who's plagiarized i've done this plenty of times and whenever you teach college you're going to read plagiarized if there's an essay <laughs> to be turned in students will plagiarize and it's just how it goes welcome to the world um so i this is i've never i've never surprised by this um and and you look and it's not as offensive to me it doesn't feel offense as offensive to me because you just I'm going to get you. I've clearly got you covered. Um, and and to be honest, oftentimes when you're, you're you're plagiarizing from good sources, so actually it's better. Like I'm happy to read a quote from from a famous philosopher that you've passed off as one of your your own because I've learned something from that famous from that philosopher. Mm-hmm. That's good. It's actually mm-hmm. like helping me. Uh, you're going to get in trouble, and I've actually been educated instead of reading your prose. So it's good. I'm great. This one though, I was re- I had uh, I had one of these cases, and uh, and I was I was reading this thing, 
and it was like offensive. Mm. Like I, and not, not in the sense of like someone had cheated me or tried to pass off something. That's what plagiarism does. But actually, like I was being forced to read something that wasn't human. Right. Like, and I did not expect, and I've asked some other professors how they feel about this. And the same, we all came to the same thing. It was something that it was. I didn't want to finish it, like I, because I, I wasn't reading any actual thought, even though there was there are plenty of words. I wasn't reading any thoughts there. They were just symbols. Whereas it turns out, like essay, even a plagiarism essay is a human product. It's an action of human agency, and there's no agency here. Nothing at all. And I did. I was surprised to feel that, but they raised bigger questions to me about, wow, this is a new shift and has a lot of have a lot, lots of ramifications on what it means to be human in right. a way that I wouldn't have thought before. Right. And uh, so, so here you've got you've you've hit on something that that's central for our thinking about every kind of technology. Mm -hmm. And here, here I mean technology in the broadest sense of the word, the wheel, yep. for example. Yep. Uh, the, the the development of fire, yeah, in, a lighter in the, in the life of yeah, in Anything. the life of man, um, because invention, uh, invention in so far as it makes our lives better, mm -hmm. is a laudable thing because all of these things, all of these technologies, as I'm using the word, yes, are aids, yep. are tools, are supplements, are instruments, yep. exactly, and they're they're things that are used by human beings, uh, for human beings, yes. But in, in the case of the new advance that we've made with AI, with, with this kind of language learning model, as you're, as you're suggesting, uh, it seems that we're getting to a point where this is not a tool uh, in some way, mm -hmm. where it's its own it has a th thing. Is that true? Yep. Do you think that's true, that this, this, yeah. that this is getting outside of, this, this is crossing beyond how we usually use tools into something that is a, that is a different kind of thing? It has it has what I would call pseudo agency. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think of a good technology has technology is used in craft. Of course, techne is developing something to extend one's agency, right? So we develop we create a hammer, which is a simple technology, because it allows us to extend the ability to to impose force on something, right? I can punch I can punch nails, but it damages me and it's not very productive. But I can hammer a nail. And I'm using it, so I'm. It, the hammer doesn't work by itself. It needs an agent, so it extends the instrument, an extension of my own agency, and it, it develops that, right? And this is the the point of technology and crafts: speeds up things, makes things more efficient. Which we sometimes say, "Oh, efficiency is a problem," but no, efficiency just is extending our agency mm -hmm. so that we can be more human, right? But there is a point where technology can threaten to replace, to not extend one's agency but replace one's agency. Now, a hammer can't really replace your agency because it requires your agency, your activity, to make it work, right? But you can imagine like a, you know, a, a sort of smart hammer or something that kind of goes ahead and looks for nails and kind of hammers them by itself. And you think that's kind of still silly. Okay, fair enough. Because hammering is not really that close to our agency as humans. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, a, ham a human is not just a hammerer, right? We're knowers and lovers. But the thing with AI is, it is this self-generating and has this pseudo aspect, has a pseudo agency, such that it, you can start to treat it like it has its own motive force, its own self movement, and it can start to do your job, right? It, and and not just your job of of particular things like getting this assignment in or something, but actually do the job of being a human, which is thinking and loving. Uh, and so they haven't yet come up with AI that, you know, I haven't replaced the loving thing. I assume maybe they'll figure this out. But for the knowledge component, this thing is starting to say, hey, you know, you don't need to use me to accelerate your knowledge. You can actually have me replace you knowing something. Mm -hmm. And this is the, like the Sports Illustrated article. Right. I'm going to replace, I'm not going to help a human to write an article. I'm going to replace a human writing an article. Right. That's a big shift. Right. Uh, so the uh, so insofar as the, the point the point you made about loving, um, you know, of mm. course AI can talk romantically to you. It can say yeah. all kinds of all kinds of tender sounding ish things. Uh, but insofar as uh, it doesn't have a will, it can't choose the good of another over itself. Um, 
and nor then, produce children with you. Yes, yes, yes exactly. Yeah, loving, exactly. You know, yeah. Like the like the, the, the or giving me a hug. Like I think a computer might eventually, but uh, and I think this is really a threat. Um, so mm. there are a couple projects being developed in the church right now that are kind of interesting, right? Like one is a a chat catechism, where it's a ch- chat GPT type based model where you can interact with mm. AI, yeah, and sure. this thing will tell you whatever you want to know about the Catholic faith. Yeah, you know, so it's, so it's just a catechism that talks to you. Mm-hmm. Um, control F, but yes. it talks more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, like okay, so you so anyone yeah. anyone can search a PDF of the Catechism, um, but uh, but now this thing will just do it for you, and, and it'll be a little bit more user friendly. And yeah. I suppose this module will be developed, and we can put it on parish websites mm-hmm. uh, yes. throughout the world. Yeah, uh, that will not bring people to the church the way that a priest does. Right, and I'm I'm and I'm I'm radically convicted of that. Not just because it won't drink a beer with you in a bar the way that a priest does or because it it can't preach the way that a, that a priest can out of his out of the own, out of the experiences of his life and his own his own experience of God's love um but it it uh it, it won't minister to you in the name of Jesus Christ the way that a priest does so so there there's mm-hmm. all kinds of levels here um at, at stake right our humanity uh, the way that that humanity was brought up in the working of our redemption and the way that that Humanity brought up in the work of our redemption yeah. is conformed to Christ sacramentally in the nature of the priesthood. Um, you know, there, there, there are real things at stake here for Catholics um, that have to be distinguished as separate from whatever chat bots are going to be invented. You know, these things are in progress now. Sure. They will be out there shortly. Um, and I think we're going to experience very quickly the, the, the limits of them. Yes. Because being a Christian, as Pope Benedict says, right, isn't a matter of adopting a set of ideas but mm-hmm. having an encounter with with Jesus Christ. Yes. Oh, well, I think and when we're important to say the discover the limits of them, what we mean is we need to realize the limits of of what they can do not in their technical ability. There may not be no there may be almost no limits on that. Yes, oh, absolutely. But in the limits yep. of what what it is attempt what we are attempting to allow it to do. So this yes. is a replacement of so uh, of humanity as opposed to the augmentation of humanity. Right. So if I can be, do I have time to be a little Heideggerian about Let's this? Let's go, yeah. Okay. Let's um, do it. So I think, so part of the, t- the title of the of the episode, Questions Concerning Technology, is taken from a from 1953 uh, lecture essay that he, uh, Heidegger gave. Martin Heidegger is a German philosopher in the 20th century. I uh, thought deeply about these issues of technology and what it means to be a human being, and Dasein, the existential analytic, blah, 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 blah. Um, but he, he, he saw the problem of technology, and he saw it, in a sense, he's helpful because he saw the in, it's inevitable. So deeply in the ingrained in the Western mindset is efficiency and techne. This is, in a way, and of course in the Greeks, the Aristotle, techne is sometimes just knowledge, right. and yet right. it's also craft and skill. So these are the, the drive to technology, the, this, this sort of thing is inherent in the notion of uh, Western science and our kind of knowing about the world, okay? But his, his concern is that technology at some point, as inevitable as it is, starts to reframe, he calls it. So gestell is the inframing sense, the kind of setting up a frame that replaces a non-technological frame, a human frame, you could say. So he has, I'll just read a little, just really a little quote about, about this that I think is, is pertinent. It's a beautiful essay in general, uh, and one of his more intelligible ones. It's actually readable. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he says, the threat to man with technology does not come in the first instance from the potentially lethal machines and apparatuses of technology. So you could have the sense of technology as, you know, oh, it's going to replace us and bomb us. And you hear this sometimes with AI. And I don't know if that's really credible. I'm not in, that's not the most interesting one. That could destroy humans. Right. But it won't destroy our humanity. He says the actual threat has already afflicted man in his essence. This is the technology point. The rule of inframing, that's the kind of viewpoint of what technology does, it replaces us, threatens man with the, potenti- with the possibility that it could be denied to him to enter into a more original revealing and hence to experience the call of a more primal truth. What does that mean? It means that with technology, the danger is that we will re-understand ourselves as passive recipients of the goings-on of the world as opposed to active agents and players, Audrey, is to actually work. We actually do things and use technology, and instead we flip, technology will inframe us such that we become the instruments of the technology, 
This, I think, in small ways, not to freak out about emails or anything, is but we can already see this. When I'm typing or text or something or email, it's presenting to me possibilities of how to carry on with the sentence. It's telling me already what I ought to say or what I might say or what I generally say or something. And it's easy to let this thing start to fill in. And the more you let it fill in, well, eventually what happens here? It's no longer me doing the writing and me doing the choosing. I'm now just the kind of necessary condition of technology doing all of the, all of the work. Right, so I haven't, I haven't allowed it to augment me. There's a point, this, this switch, where I no longer allow technology and AI and techn to augment my activity, right. but I now it replaces my human activity. Yeah, I, and I think that to your point about this, this passive, uh, the, the, uh, the way that we're engaging reality in a passive way, I think we can also see this, not, not just in mm -hmm. the way that AI is uh, yeah. modifying how we use um, things like email, but... Um, we're seeing this modification of, of what, how human beings recreate with Netflix mm -hmm. because it's so easy to go and to turn on this, you know, basically limitless world of entertainment where all the screen does is just throw something at you and you can just sit in front of it. As opposed to reading a book or doing something. Yes. Smoking it, a pipe. Yep, exactly. Uh, having a conversation with another human being. Yes, exactly. And I think the, so the threat when you said it's going to destroy humanity uh, is it, I think Heidegger has the good point about this that it's it's not humanity qua humans yes like individual humans yes but it is very serious that it, it, the essence of what it means to be human which is to be yes. a rational actor yeah, that's right the rational yeah. actor it's going to replace not only our rationality in the sense of telling us what it is to to know and 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 to have knowledge right replace that so that we just we don't actually try to grab knowledge and know things anymore we just grant grant grab random facts, and then we spit them out. But also, the more and more fundamentally, the actor part, the agency right. aspect, I think it subtly undermines that. So it, it, it does threaten, as all technology always did, but now, because of its power, uh, brings up the essence of technology, which is the threatening of the essence of humanity. Uh, again, non-nuclear holocaust sense, but actually in the metaphysical sense of we'll forget who we are as humans, and that means that this limit thing, that we realize it's limitations, we might not know its limitations because we've forgotten that we are humans and what it means to be a human is to actually act. It's possible, of course, that it raises the real question and the good, this is the old Felix Culpa, I suppose, is that we realize, you know, I do care that a human wrote that. Not because of, it's not made up or something, but because I care, humans ought to do things. Or I do care that um, this wasn't from this, came out from this, or that I wrote, made this myself, that I chose to do this as opposed to it kind of deciding what to do for me. So it makes, it makes clear what it is to be a human. And the question is, can we rise to the occasion to embrace that and realize that our essence is, essence is being threatened here uh, in subtle ways, nonetheless in real, significant, in real ways that could change how we exist, not to be too dire or Heideggerian or this, but I think it's a problem. I think it's, a, and Christ came to save and he was an actor and our salvation is dependent on us being responsive to him as actors in grace. It needs to be, we're, we are agents, right? To others and to, to God and God to us by bringing us out. So, this is a it's a threat to to not only humanity but also the fundamental message of Christianity as not just a Gnostic kind of event but rather an act of love that has a choice involved because as you say AI is just it doesn't do choice it might do knowledge this could be a Franciscan over Dominican victory and turns out turns out knowledge is just kind of a passive thing uh, but it doesn't do choice it just can't do it uh, and but we might think well we get close enough with it. So we don't really need choice anymore. Ah, that'll be dire. Hopefully, friends, you're leaving this episode with more questions rather than answers. Uh, insofar as we've, we've, yeah. we've, we've prompted you to be reflective on the ways that we interface with these things and to, to really deeply consider what, what they mean and how we're integrating them in our lives. Because ultimately, as Father, Father Bonaventure is saying, this is going to impact the way we, we relate to our God. 
Thanks for tuning in to this episode of God's Planning. If you like our podcast, please follow us on Facebook, X, Instagram, TikTok. Like, subscribe, and leave a five-star review. If you'd like to donate to our podcast through Patreon, follow the link in the description. You can also find in our show notes links to shop God's Planning merch, to get information on upcoming God's Planning events, and a showcase of new AI-generated God's Planning art. Maybe. No promises. As always, friends, we appreciate your prayers for us because prayer is something that only a human being can do. We ask that you continue to pray for us and know that we're praying for you. God bless. Father Gregory. Tis I. How many goldfish did you have growing up? Um, I think like three. One mostly at state fairs. They didn't last too long, and I flushed them. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, <laughs> God's Planning. <laughs> <laughs>